All right, Psalm 94 is a, is a psalm here where we're going we're gonna to look at the first verse, of course. We're going to look at all the verses. We're going to look at the first verse and then uh, see uh, the last verse also ties it up pretty nicely. The first verse says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. So the entreaty here to the Lord is, is, is a righteous person seeking vengeance from God. Right? And look, there's nothing ungodly about that or unchristian about that. This is the word of God. We have plenty of psalms like this in the Bible that's saying, look, man, there's some really wicked people out there, Lord, and, and we're looking for you to bring vengeance. And of course, you know, the Bible teaches clearly that vengeance belongs to God, right? Like it says here, to whom vengeance belongeth, to the Lord. Like, like you're the one. So we don't go around trying to bring vengeance on people ourselves. But look, when, when there's a lot of wicked and wrongdoing being done in this world, we want to seek, we want vengeance to, to come. We want God to bring forth righteousness and to bring forth vengeance on the evildoers, the, 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 the wicked people that the Bible is talking about specifically in this passage too. We're going to get way more in depth on that. And the Psalm ends there in verse 23 saying, he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. So there's a, a great conclusion here to the matter of the, you've got the entreaty and then the confidence knowing that God will judge. Verse two says, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. And there's multiple um, references in the scripture here that when you study them out and you look at, well, what is this really talking about? What group of people is this talking about? We're going to see over and over and over again throughout this Psalm, throughout Psalm 94, that this is talking about uh, reprobates. This is talking about people who have just uh, uh, are, are the, the most vile, wicked people on the earth where they've pushed things too far. They've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. They've, uh, um, made it so that they are beyond redemption. They are like what Jude would call uh, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And um, we're going to go through some various examples here. We're going to see how this plays out. But uh, first of all, it, it mentions these people that, that the request for vengeance is being brought down and for God to judge against the proud. And I've got even just in Psalm 119 alone, we're going to see uh, if you want to keep your place here in Psalm 94 and turn, if you would, to Psalm 119, uh, we're going to see this, this group that's tagged as the proud. And any one of these individual um, tags, as I call them, you, you might see like, so you can have all manner of people who are proud. You can have saved people who are proud, right? You can have, you have people who are guilty of these sins or you know, as we're going to see, someone could do evil, that's saved. Someone could do wicked, that's saved. But, but as we get through this, I want you to see that that's not, what we're, that's not what's being discussed here. That's not who's being uh, characterized. It's not, it's not just like um, anyone just doing any one particular thing, but it's talking about a group of people here. So the same group of people are the proud. The same group of people are the evil, the wicked, the, those that are... That are um, well, I don't, again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, that are preparing snares for people that are, that are lying in wait, that are, that are these really wicked people. We see these people being brought up here in Psalm 94. But uh, you're in Psalm 119, look at verse number 21, a reference here to uh, what, we, what we're reading here as the proud. Psalm 119 verse 21 says, Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Psalm 119 verse 51 says, the proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. Verse 69, the proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Verse 78, let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause but I will meditate in thy precepts. precepts. Verse 85, the proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. And then in verse 122, be surety for thy servant for good, let not the proud oppress me. So we see 
these attacks, the dealing perversely, digging pits, forging lies, having this righteous man in derision. Why? Because he's serving God. And that's why he keeps bringing up, look, they're doing this to me, but I'm not declining from your law. They're coming against me. They're digging pits. They're trying to make me fail. So these are people who are diametrically opposed to someone who's trying to be righteous, someone who's trying to follow the law of God, someone who's trying to do good. These aren't just people who are just kind of out there and just saying, yeah, you do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. This isn't just your average person. These are the people who are, that, that are vehemently fighting against the things of God because they're, they're actively doing things to deal perversely, to dig pits, to oppress. Uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm 140. Psalm 140, we're going to see another uh, example, another reference to the proud which is found in verse number five, but we're going we're gonna to read the context going up to verse five because, again, just as we're going to see in Psalm 94, these are characteristics of the same group of people that are being referred to as the proud. Verse number one there in Psalm 140 says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips, Selah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my goings. The proud have hid a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me, Selah. And this is, there, there, there's a, a certain type of, a person out there that has these, this bad, just, just really stinking bad fruit where um, it's even more, uh, uh, I would say, um, laid out in Second Peter chapter 2 and in the book of Jude and in Romans chapter 1 about these people who are reprobate about, you know, they, they could be false prophets like Second Peter chapter 2 and Jude point out. Uh, as well as in Romans chapter 1, those that have given themselves over to a reprobate mind, but they all share these same characteristics and same qualities. And, and while, as I mentioned pr pr previously, you have to remember any one of these things or two of these things or whatever, you may, you know, people, anyone can be guilty of, but what it's doing is characterizing a group of people that are reprobate. Because this is like what they're about. This is who they are. And, and I've, I've brought this up many times before. I, like, I think it's a, an easy way to understand this concept and this doctrine from the scripture is um, we, one, absolutely we're all sinners and, and we all worthy of hell. Every single one of us. Everybody has, has you know, come short of glory of God 100%. 100%. And you know, our, our righteousness is like filthy rags in God's eyes. We, you know, we really don't measure up to God's standard and we fall way short. He says, however, there still are differences in characteristics and traits and behaviors where, you know, many of us, I would say probably everyone in this room, I, I mean, I'd, I'd be shocked if, if, if it wasn't this, case, this way, but... Um, were the type of person that would literally be setting traps for people to do evil, to do wicked, right? Uh, say like before you got saved of, of saying, here's what I'm going to do and I'm going to plan this and I'm not going to get rest unless I've done some evil like the book of Proverbs talks about the wicked doer that, that, that has this set in their heart where their heart is really just that dark and that cold and that stony to just, to just be focused on being violent, being evil, being wicked, uh, having their tongues like serpents here that's being described. That's not your average unsaved person. It's just not. Your average unsaved person is a sinner like everyone else is a sinner, but they fall short and they fail like everyone else does. But there is a category of people whose heart God has hardened. 
and that God has given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And this is, this is the perfect explanation for what we see in this world when you look at people who are psychopathic. It makes perfect sense. Because how else can you describe someone who has their conscience seared like with a hot iron, like the Bible describes? People who have their conscience seared to where they, they, they don't, you know, what they do has no effect on them. That is not a normal person. And as we review this, I want you to understand that just as psychopathic people make up a very small percentage of the population, so do the reprobate in general because they're basically one and the same. It's, it's the same type of person there that's being described. It is the same person being described, but the world will tell you, yeah, that's a psychopath. And we see examples of that when, when they become very murderous and, and do all manner of, of just extremely disgusting, wicked things that no normal person would ever think in a million years. And the only reason those things even happen is because they've been given over to this reprobate mind, their conscience is seared, and their heart is hardened, and they are beyond redemption. And it's not because of some particular sin that they commit, that they've, oh, you've, you've committed the sin of cannibalism, so therefore... Now you've crossed the line. No, they crossed the line with God prior to that. As Romans 1 describes, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their own imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, right? And, and that's when they worship and serve the creature more than the creator who's blessed forever. And just as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So, they had the chance. They knew God. They had the understanding of the gospel, but then they just rejected it and they, they just had no, wanted nothing to do with it. So it's not that they never had the chance. It's not that they, they, they were just damned from birth and could never, ever possibly believe. No, they could have believed. But there's a point where God will harden the heart. And, then, and that's when they turn into these monsters, right? And then they're capable of doing anything because look not everyone is capable of like becoming a jeffrey dahmer <laughs> right i mean seriously like i just think about some of the some of the darker friends that i had just just as being unsaved and having all that kinds of different friends and people who were doing you know kind of being more wicked than other people there's still a limit there like for my friends that weren't just total reprobates, it's just like there's, everyone's got a limit and that's like, you know, it's like, like, like doing something perverted to a child. Like no, no one's going to do that unless you're, you know, you've already been warped and twisted and given over to this reprobate mind to do something so vile and so disgusting. To lie with a beast, to do something, you know, it's just these are things that like, it, it just goes so far. You have to have your conscience seared in order to be able to even commit such atrocities. And it's a perfect explanation. And the Bible's warning us about this, and we see this a lot in Scripture. It's not just some, you know, oh, you've got one or two verses or one or two references. I mean, we're seeing this time and time again, which is why I preach on it, right? Because it's important to understand that these people exist, and it's, and it's important to understand that it's not wrong that God would bring vengeance on these people. And so you have to be able to reconcile that as well, right? Because we want to be long-suffering and forgiving and merciful and walk in the spirit and be just like God is in that regard and, 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 and love our, our neighbor as ourself and love our enemies, right? These things all have to fit without contradiction. And the way that that works and the way that that fits is of course, the general rule overall is we are going to intercede for people. We are going to try to help people. We are going to try to show mercy on people. That is what we're all about. But there is this group of people who have had their hearts hardened, that have been given over to a reprobate mind, that no matter what you do, it's not going to change anything anyways. And, and all they do and all their heart is set on is only evil continually. They have, that, you know, they, they, they have their eyes that cannot cease from sin is how they're described in Scripture. So, so people that literally just, it's like 
nonstop sin all the time, I mean, that, that's, that's the person where we see, and it's consistent in Scripture, that's where we see uh, the people looking for God's vengeance. And later on in the book of Revelation, you're going to see those that take the mark of the beast. Well, the Bible is clear that everyone that takes the mark of the beast is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever takes the mark or worships the beast or his image, they're all going to go to hell, every single one of them. <clears throat> And those are going to be the same people who are persecuting and martyring the people of God. And those are the same people then that the martyrs up in heaven are going, how long, Lord? How long will it be before you bring vengeance on this people? And what I love to point out about that passage is the people saying that, they're not in the flesh. They're not committing sin. They've already passed on. They're in their spirit in heaven before the Lord not committing sin, saying, God, how long before you bring your vengeance on these wicked people on this earth? And, and, and you know, recompense our blood from their hands. So there's nothing unjustified or ungodly or sinful about having that mindset uh, about this particular group of people. Now, I'm also going to say this because we don't always know who these people are either, right? So you just want to be careful because you can't just start pegging too many people just like all oh, these people are reprobates, right? Like, like, I don't like what they said or they said something against me or they're trying to stop my soul winning, so they're reprobates. Like, no, that, no, that's not the case, right? And, and part of the balance of this is just remember the Apostle Paul who he said he was chief of sinners, and he was going out and he was getting people arrested and he was trying to stop the soul winning and stop the, the preaching of Jesus Christ and, and get churches shut down. And he was actively fighting against the people of God. So, and was he a reprobate? No, of course not. Obviously not. Because he got saved and did all these great works, right? So, so when we look at that, we, we have to keep that in mind to keep us balanced. So we say, look, but just remember the Apostle Paul, right? When, when you're dealing with people, before you jump to vengeance, before you jump to praying to God, hey, bring vengeance on this person because they're super wicked. You know, that, that shouldn't be our default because of all the teaching that teaches us about being, you know, merciful and loving our enemies. And stuff. look, it, the Apostle Paul was an enemy to those who were preaching the gospel, absolutely. But then he became their ally. But he wasn't a God hater. As the Bible explains and as he explains, you know, he did it ignorantly in unbelief. It was ignorant. And that's the key, that's one of the key differences between the reprobate and someone like the Apostle Paul. He was just ignorant. And ignorance means you don't know. The reprobate, on the other hand, they do know. They knew God and they glorified him not as God. They knew the truth, they knew the right way. And just said, no, I want nothing to do with that. Whereas most people, they simply don't know, right? And some people will never know. They never come to that understanding and come to that knowledge, unfortunately, before they die. But they're not um, just given over to this reprobate mind either. So let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Turn, uh, turn, if you would, to Malachi, the book of Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. Because there is a group of people that are known as the proud, at least in, in our modern era, our, our modern time, that I think we can know that they fit into this category. And specifically, based primarily on what Romans 1 talks about as well as, you know, a few other places. But, but Romans chapter 1 talks about, um, and, I'll, and I quoted some of this already earlier, but I'll read it again uh, while you're going to Malachi chapter 3. Romans 1, 21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the bird, 
birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So this is what happens first. The knowledge of God, the rejection of God, and just turning to some other God, okay, and making up their own God. Now, because of this, in verse 24, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, again, because they changed the truth of God, because they worship and serve the creature more than creator, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. And the word vile is, it's disgusting. It is gross. It's vile. It's, it's like, ugh. Vile affections. And then clarifies, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And meat just means appropriate. The recompense of their error which is appropriate. Why? They left the natural use. The women left the natural use of the man. The man left the natural use of the woman. And that's we have men with men, women with women, doing vile, disgusting acts on each other with these vile affections that... God gave them up to even do those things because they already rejected God. It's not that they did those things and then rejected God and now that, you know, no, they rejected God first. That's the order that we see being presented here in Scripture is that they already chose in their mind to, to, to hate God and have not, want to have nothing to do with God and then God gives them up to these vile affections and they're burned in their lust. And again, I'll make this point. I don't want to make this whole sermon just about this one thing because there's a lot of other things we're going to do, but it is, there's a lot of this subject here in this passage. When it's talking about here leaving the natural use, being burned in their lust, of course there's a possibility for someone to do something, you know, to, to commit some sin, to commit some, some act, Right? And, and, not, and still not be a reprobate. Like, I, I, I definitely believe that there are situations that people could get themselves into and do things that are completely not right and abominable and wicked, but wouldn't categorize them still as being a reprobate. But when you see it, you know it. I mean, the people who are... They're, they're burned in their lust. They don't care. They foam out their own shame, right? It's this out and proud, the proud attitude, which is where I was getting with all of this, being known as the proud, which Malachi 3, by the way, I do turn to Malachi 3.15 says, and now we call the proud happy. Now we have a pride event every year and a pride month. And who is it that's involved in pride? It's the people that call themselves happy. Because another word for happy is gay, which used to be a good word. And that's been taken and misused into people who do vile things with each other. Reprehensible things, disgusting things, abominable things, trashing such a nice word like gay. There's nothing happy about committing vile acts at all. Nothing happy about that. It's disgusting. But just as in Malachi, and look, there's nothing new under the sun. Malachi 3, now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Isn't this what we're seeing today? Just, they're getting lifted up. They're getting set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. This is the world we live in. This is the, this is the same world that the people in the day of Malachi lived in too. Chapter 4, verse 1, Malachi, the Bible says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud... Yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. 
and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Let's go back to Psalm 94. And you're going to notice a lot of similar words and a lot of similar themes in all these references that I'm bringing up, which is why I'm bringing them up. We're going to read through these and we're going to see um, very, very similar in the truth that's being presented. Psalm 94, verse 3, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? And this, this is part of the entreaty of going, look, God, judge, vengeance, bring vengeance, bring righteousness, be the judge. How long are these wicked people going to be triumphing, going to be getting away with all their wickedness, going to be lifted up, and we're going we're to live in this place where we have all these extremely wicked people just being set up and exalted and not being judged and not being brought down where they belong. God, how long is this going to go on? How long, verse 4, Shall they utter and speak hard things? And we're going to see this reference later, a little bit later in, in the book of Jude. Just remember that here it says that they speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. Now, I'm not going to go and do the workers of iniquity thing. We did that study already not that long ago in scripture about the workers of iniquity. Again, it's referring to this group of people because every time it brings up this phrase, every time it brings up these, you know, a, a group that's, that's, that's being defined like this, it's always consistent. And you see the same characteristics and the same attributes about these same people in scripture. You can't ignore that. It's not just, oh, they just happen to use this phrase, workers of iniquity, as in just they're just regular sinners. No, it's because it's applying, it's always being applied to the same extremely vile people that are full of pride, full of wickedness, full of evil, and, and just continually like only do evil. Or an all about, always about evil. Verse number five, they break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. So, now, and again, here's the, um, the um, persecution against God's people, specifically. Just the wicked people that can't, that, that rage at the things of God and that they are just bent on shutting down and stopping anything Christian. You know, open your eyes. It's happening all the time. You see it. You see it. And you see it all over the board, too. It's not just the fundamental Baptists that are getting heathen raging. I mean, it's, it's anything associated with being godly whatsoever. I mean, you should see some of these people that try to speak out against abortion on, on colleges and stuff, and they're just getting shouted down, and, and, and all these extremely wicked, vile Antifa people are coming out. And, you know, that's, that's all the gender-bending group. That's all the people that just hate life. They hate anything that's remotely godly whatsoever. And they'll scream and fight and be violent against anything that's righteous at all and and these are the types of people and this is what we're seeing happening and again even in that group you're going to have the really bad people and then you get those that kind of get caught up in some of that stuff and are deceived and are ignorant right so you can't just broad brush everybody on these things even though a group does exist that's being characterized here in the scripture but you still can't just broad brush every single like oh man every single person there is just like you know, uh, is a reprobate. You, you can't know that for sure. But, it, but it's interesting how you can see the same characteristics coming out in general from these groups. Verse number five, they break in pieces thy people. I already read this, O Lord, and inflict on heritage. Verse six, they slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. And it, this shows you how wicked the heart of these people are because how vile and how reprehensible do you have to be to kill the widow, right? And, and typically when the Bible's talking about the widow, it's not talking about a male widow. It's referring to the female widow, the, 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 the woman who lost her husband and needs help and needs protection as nobody out there doing anything for her because her husband died, right? She, she would need, of course, relying on the help of other family members and friends, but a lot more vulnerable because she doesn't have her husband there to protect her and look over her safety because, because he's passed away. So, 
I mean, you think about the elderly and the people who commit crimes against. I mean, how vile and reprehensible do you have to be to go after defenseless people? And it's all about these defenseless people. The stranger, they're at a big disadvantage. They don't know the land. They don't know the area. They might not know the language, you know, and they're, and they're being taken advantage of. Or the fatherless. Again, someone who doesn't have a figure there to help protect them. All of these people, the widow, the stranger, the fatherless, are people who are in a vulnerable condition, a vulnerable state. They're the easy marks for the wicked people to attack. More indicative of their dark, vile heart. Turn to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. These are the passages that have these whole sections, these whole groups, these whole passages of the same characteristics being used to describe these people. It's not a one-off here. It's not, a, it's not one sin that one person did here. It's not one thing there. It's like, this is who these people are. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible reads, This know also that in the last, di last days perilous times shall come. Perilous, of course, means dangerous for men shall be lovers of their own selves. This is the conceited, proud attitude of, oh, look at me and I'm so great. It's a haughty attitude. They love themselves. Covetous. How about this? Boasters. We already see in, in Psalm 94.4 that they boast themselves. Proud. We already saw that as well in, in Psalm 94.2. Um, Talks about the proud, render reward to the proud. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, as we read in Romans chapter 1. Truce breakers, right? That if you have a truce with someone, what are you doing? They're breaking the peace. They're breaking the promise. They're breaking their covenants. They're liars. False accusers, incontinent, fierce. I mean, fierce is... is just doing evil against people. I mean, they're fierce. Despisers of those that are good. They hate it. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. The word reprobate means rejected. They're rejected concerning the faith. And what do we have to do to be saved? Put our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they are rejected concerning the the faith. They are reprobate. They can't be saved. Their heart is hardened and darkened by God. Back to Psalm 94. Verse number seven, yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. In their arrogance, they do all this wickedness. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless, which was the verse right before this one. And then they're like, hey, God's not going to see anything. God can't see. I could do this stuff and get away with it. And who is the Lord and who is God? He's, he, pff, you think I'm worried about God? This is the attitude. God can't see. God, Jacob's not going to guard it, regard it. Verse 8, understand ye brutish among the people. And there's another word that's also used elsewhere in Scripture. Brute. Natural brute beasts. Brute. A brute is stupid. So you brutish among the, the people and ye fools, when will ye be wise? And turn, if you would, to the book of Jude. Right near the end of the Bible, right before the book of Revelation, you're going to find the book of uh, Jude. Jude. 
And we'll just read a few of the verses out of here that are relevant and, and line up perfectly with all of these other things that we're seeing in, in all of these other references. Jude, verse 10, the Bible reads, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. And, you know, read the whole book later of Jude to get all the context of these things. I'm, 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 for sake of time, not going through everything. Hopefully you're writing down the passages here so you can get all of it in context. And, again, just verify that my comparisons here and how I'm illustrating what Psalm 94 is referencing matches what Romans 1 is saying, what 2 Timothy 3 is saying, what Jude is saying, and, and, and do your own homework and decide for yourself. Are you seeing all these same things match up and line up? I would say yes. Verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. These are infiltrators. They're the wolves in sheep's clothing. Yet they could just easily do that without any fear. Just like in Psalm 94, we're saying, look, God doesn't see. He doesn't regard it. They don't care at all. They have their conscience seared. It doesn't matter to them at all. And so it's easy. Like normal people, you know, you try to, to be deceitful or something. It's not that easy. Right? I mean, I say this to my wife all the time. Like there's no way I could ever hide anything from my wife. Like I am terrible even if I just want to like get her a gift or something, like, like I'm horrible at that. I'm better off just being like, all right, here, I just got you this. <laughs> it's like a month in advance or something, but here you go. Because it's, it's, just, it's just difficult to kind of to maintain that. And obviously, buying a gift, you're like excited about wanting to give it anyways. But there's too many things where it's just like, man, like there's no way you could hide it. But, but why? Because you'd, you'd be like thinking about it a lot, you know? And I think most people probably you know, are, are, are going to be in a similar condition of just kind of going like, well, yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not natural for you to just be such a liar. But for these people, not a big deal at all. These are the psychopathic people. That is, it's, just, it's just no, no empathy, no emotion, no conscience. I can do whatever. These are spots in your fair feast of charity, verse 12, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth. And that says, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root. And look, if this doesn't show you that they're, again, another illustration that they are reprobate, they're done for, that twice dead. Look, what, what do we need in order to see the kingdom of God? We need to be born again, right? So we have one birth where we're alive, we're brought into this world, and then our second birth, that's spiritual birth. So we need to be twice alive, as it were, in order to go to heaven. Well, these people are twice dead. Why? Because all they have left is their physical life, but they're, they're spiritually, I mean, they're, they're done, and just as those who are born again become a child of God and you can never stop being a child of God, those that are reprobate have become children of the devil. And, go, and there's another fun study. Go ahead and search that one out for yourself. Look up children, any forms of child, children of the devil, and child or chi children of Belial, all, all of those references, any, any common name for Satan, any common name for child, son, look up and do that study. And again, you're going to find it's not every person who's unsaved in the world is a child of the devil. No, that's a lie. It's not true. Just as much as every person in the world is also not a child of God. But as many as believe, you know, believe on him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. To many as received him, excuse me, to many as received him. But those that received him, uh, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even those that believe on his name. And... It's those people who become children of the devil that are reprobate, that they're twice dead. They're without fruit. They're plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. 
wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Verse 14, and Enoch also the seventh of, from Adam prophesied of these, saying, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And remember, this is what I was talking about, about them speaking hard things in verse 4 of Psalm 94, to execute judgment upon all, verse 15, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. All in the same context and reference of Jude, referring to these false prophets, these false brethren, they sneak, they creep in unawares, and they are rotten to the core, and they have their hard speeches just like Psalm 94 talks about these wicked people that speak and utter hard things. Let's go back to Psalm 94, verse number 9. Now again, we've read a lot of other verses besides just Psalm 94. So to bring us back up to speed just now getting into the context again, we see the, the plea for vengeance, right? Hey, God, judge the proud. We see, hey, how long are the wicked going to triumph? They're going to win. They, they, they do wickedly. They're, they're doing these bad things. They're breaking people in pieces. They're slaying the widows and the strangers. And then they have the mindset going, hey, God can't see me. God can't do anything to me. And then here's a little bit of an admonition or a, a rebuke saying, hey, look, understand you brutish among the people, you fools. When will you be wise? He that planted the ear, verse 9, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Like, hey, dummy, <laughs> you think God's not going to hear and God's not going to see? He made your eyeballs. He made the ear. You think he can't see and hear? Like, he's the creator. He made everything. Who do you think you are? But this is how these people get so wrapped up in themselves and so lifted up with pride, as so we're going to call them the proud, they're blind. Like the more proud someone is, the more blind they are to reality. Because they're so wrapped up and full of themselves, they lose a grip on just, like, like they literally believe these things. Like God's that can't see me. God, I mean, what a ridiculous thought, right? And this is the sobering truth going, <laughs> who do you think you are he that planted the ear, you think he's not going to hear? Verse 10, he that chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. You don't even have to do or say anything out loud or in public. He knows the thoughts. He knows the intents of the heart. He knows all. I mean, the, all the thoughts you could be thinking on in your head right now that nobody else knows. God knows every single one of those things. Every single one. Verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. And amen to that. Hey, blessed are those that God chastens. That word chasten you're being disciplined. You're being punished. You say, what in the world? What do you, why would I be blessed if I'm being punished by God? Because that means God loves you. Because God doesn't just chasten and try to correct and discipline people he doesn't care about. He's just going to let them go off and do whatever. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I will read for you from Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, 11, the Bible reads, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. You're being chastened of God, you know that God loves you. And he's just going to deal with you as a son. And you might need some correction, but thank God for giving us that correction. I mean, think about this too. You're like, yeah, but no one likes correction. But we should. 
You don't like it like literally maybe at the moment because you're dealing with the correction itself and it, and it stings and it hurts and it's not fun. But the whole purpose of that stinging, of that hurt, is to prevent the much greater damage, the much greater hurt of the end result of whatever you're doing, that what it would do to you, right? It, it's like this, the, 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 the child, the little toddler that wants to run out into the street, you spank their butt and you give them that, that sting and you give them that, that feeling of like, ah! you're like, I'd never want to have that happen to me ever again in my life. But why do you do that? You know, those are the situations like, no, don't do that. Because you're looking out for their life. Because how much more would it hurt if the bus comes paddling down the street and slams them to the pavement? That's what you're protecting them against. And when we start sinning against God, God might need to come into your life and go, hey, son, straighten up. And it's going to cause you some discomfort in your life. And it's going to be like, man, that wasn't fun at all. But it's because he's going to protect you from like your own demise and your own just, just fall into the, the worst conditions of just following down a sinful path that's going to get worse and worse and worse. And the wages of sin is death. And it's going to just cause more misery and destruction in your life. So he stops you from that. And that's why the Bible says, hey, blessed is the man whom thou chastenest. That's a blessing to stop you from going down that bad path. It's the whole point. Hebrews 12, verse 5, the Bible reads, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Another reason, especially in the context of Psalm 94, why is it bless, the man blessed who receives chastening? Because then it means you're not a bastard. Because God chastens his children, and he chastens every son that he receives. No one is above not receiving some chastening of the Lord. Because we're all sinners, because we all fall short, nobody is perfect. Nobody is above that rebuke and that correction of the Lord. So everyone who's saved gets a correcting. And if you're sitting there going like, I don't think I've ever been chastened of God, just ever for anything in my life, then I would check your salvation. Because that's what, the, what Hebrews 12 is talking about here. Now look, you don't go looking at other people going like, I've never seen him get chastened before. You, know, like, you are the only one that will know that for yourself. You're the only one. Because the chastening can come in all different forms. Some are more obvious than others. And the severity of the chastening, depending on the severity of what you've been doing. Right? I mean, I know I can look back, and you all have probably heard this story too many times, but, but you know, and I'm not even going to go into it, but there's t I've received so much worse punishment than what other people around me that did similar things had done time and time again, um, especially when I was in the world, out of church, living a wicked lifestyle, doing all that, definitely got punished a lot more. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not gonna, there's no reason to get in that story tonight. Stories. <laughs> There's more than one. But look, that means you're a son, right? And that's for your own benefit, right? It's not to, to, to show other people, but you should know for yourself, hey, God, he chastens every son. It doesn't mean you're getting chastened all the time. It just means, that, look, I mean, there's, there, there has to have been some time. Unless you're newly saved, right? And just be aware, like, hey, God's... <laughs> You're, you're, probably not, you're not going to be perfect, and you're going to have to deal with some chastening of the Lord, and, uh, and it happens. So, verse number 9, Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. 
Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Turn if you go to Hebrews chapter 13, since you're in Hebrews 12 already, and I'll just read the next verse in Psalm 94. Psalm 94, just reiterating from uh, verse 12, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. And then verse 14 says, For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. And amen. Amen. Right, every child of God, look, you have an inheritance. You're saved. You have eternal security in Christ. You are a child of God forever. He's not going to cast you off. He's not going to forsake his inheritance. Just as Hebrews 13, 5 says, let your conversation be without covetous and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I just love how like it's just so close together. We were talking about Hebrews 12 was talking about the chasing. Hebrews 13 is talking about Hey, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. Psalm 94 was talking about, hey, blessed is the man whom thou chastenest. And then verse 14, hey, for the Lord's not going to cast off his people. Neither will he forsake his inheritance. Let's go back to Psalm 94. He's not going to forsake his inheritance, but, verse 15, Judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Now, again, and, and when we read the Psalms, a lot of Psalms are like this. You're going to see the perspective of the psalmist, which would be like a man typically, Sometimes it may be a prophecy of Christ or some other things, but generally speaking, we see these, uh, the, the, the point of view of, of a child of God, right? But then we'll, awful, we'll also oftentimes see a response back that would be from God's perspective, right? And, and sometimes we'll see some back and forth here. And um, But here, let, let me just get my bearings here again. Verse number 16, who will rise up for me against the evildoers or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Here we're still seeing the psalmist, though, asking God, like, look, he needs help, right? He's got the workers of iniquity. He's got evildoers coming against him. But it's also our duty to stand up against the evildoers and against the workers of iniquity as well as God's people here defending the word of God and doing the work of God. You've got workers of iniquity and you've got workers of righteousness, You've got evildoers and you've got good doers. And we are called to stand up against the workers of iniquity. Verse 17 says, unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. So he's like, if it weren't for God, then I would have been silent. Silent against what? Or against who? Against the evildoers, against the workers of iniquity. The people who are going to persecute and say, look, we need God's help to stand up and to fight against the wicked doers of the world. And, and, it's, and, it, and it's that bad where it's like, hey, unless God was there to help me, I, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. But you know, thank God that the Lord is there to help you and to give you the strength and give you the courage and give you the boldness to rise up against the evildoers and to be against the workers of iniquity. Verse 18, when I said my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. God's there. Oh, my foot, you know, I'm, I'm losing my ground, right? They're, 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 they're beating down on me, they're pressing down on me, and my foot slipped. Well, God's there to, uh, to help hold you up. Verse 19, in the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? And, and I love the way that these verses are written here, verses 20 and 21. And you just, just take a minute and think about that. The throne of iniquity, the throne of sin, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? 
it, which, which does what? The throne of iniquity does what? The, fr the throne of iniquity frames mischief by a law. Mischief is, it, it's going to be an attack against people, right? It's going to be evil against people, but it's also like more subtle, right? People who are mischievous, <laughs> very mischievous, right? They're going to be sneaky. They're going to be tricky. They're going to be trying to do harm and do evil, but they're doing it in a more subtle way. And the throne of iniquity frames mischief by a law. It's actually going to use the law to, to create this mischief and to get people uh, in trouble and to, and to cause evil upon people through the law. And we have examples of this. Look at verse 21. says, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous. These wicked reprobates want the righteous dead and they want them destroyed and they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. They don't care about right and wrong. They don't care about who's innocent. They just hate the things of God. They hate the righteousness and they want it to stop because it bears witness of their own evil deeds that they are reminded of and they don't want to hear it and they rage and get angry and have nothing to do with it. And, you know, one of the, the first thing that always comes to my mind when I read this about the framing mischief by a law is abortion. I mean, talking about gathering themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemning the innocent blood. I mean, what blood is more innocent than the innocent blood of, a, of an unborn child? That's like the heart of innocence. You don't get any more innocent than that. Some unborn baby still developing in the womb and the throne of iniquity is out there framing mischief by a law saying, yep, yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's not murder. No, in fact, we're going to protect you and we're going to protect your right to murder the most innocent blood on earth. How vile and wicked and reprehensible is that? That literally has to come out of the mind of Satan. It is so satanic to, to frame such a law that would allow for the murder and the condemnation of the innocent blood. And that's what we see today. And it's more than just that one thing. Of course, any law that's going to be imposed against the righteous, against the innocent blood, right? And, and here's why, why does it bring up the innocent blood? Because they want to shed blood. Anytime you look at the Bible, we're talking about the innocent blood. It's because they're not, they shouldn't be condemned, yet their blood is shed. They're innocent, right? They're not guilty. They're this innocent blood. Well, that's what the world is also trying to do with, with the hate speech, with the other, you know, with, with anything. And, and it, we're not there yet, thank God. But that's the goal of the, the throne of iniquity is trying to frame mischief by a law and put into law that uh, these things would be done. I mean, we have an example, a clear-cut example in Daniel chapter 6. The famous story of Daniel and the lion's den, Right? Daniel 6, they framed mischief by a law specifically to target Daniel and his innocent blood. They hated Daniel. Why did they hate Daniel? Because his works were righteous and theirs were evil. Same reason why Cain slew Abel. Daniel 6, 4 says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. Sounds like he's innocent. It sounds like he's not doing anything wrong. It sounds like he's being pretty righteous. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Daniel's a good guy. Daniel's a hard worker. Daniel was a faithful servant to the Lord, too in addition to being in this prestigious position within the kingdom 
and running things and just doing everything right and doing it by the book. He wasn't corrupt. He wasn't taking bribes. He wasn't doing, he didn't have a secret life. He wasn't having a mistress. He wasn't doing any of those things because if they could have found any of that stuff, they would have used it against them. But they could find nothing. So what do they do? Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. See, the one thing we know about this guy is that he is not going to break the law of God. Wow, what a, what a terrible testimony to have. Right? <laughs> then these presidents and princes assembled. And look, it's kind of like, what do you have against this guy? He's just doing what's right. What did he do to you? He's just trying to live his life. He's trying to serve God. He's trying to be as good as he can. Oh, but that makes you look bad and you don't like that. And that's so oftentimes why people want to fight against the righteous. Because the, the brighter the light that shines, the more darkness it uncovers and the more it exposes people's wickedness just in general. I mean, have you ever noticed this too? Like you start, especially fundamental Baptist, you know, more than any other group or you know, religious group or denomination within Christianity, I would say within like believing Christianity, right? It's going to be more separated, more different, just even just outwardly speaking. When it comes to the way you dress, the way you speak, you know, hopefully the way that you, you know, the things that you do, your entertainment, you know, all this stuff, right? We're trying to separate ourselves from the world, trying to be different, we're trying to live our lives different. And then it's like, we know that those things aren't the most important things, right? So like exactly how we dress is important. Yeah, the Bible talks about it, sure, but it's not like the most important thing. I mean, your heart's the most important thing, but we're still trying to get all of this stuff under control and, and we sincerely love the law of the Lord. We love the word of God and we try to do things different. And, you know, the length of your hair and the, the gender roles and all these different things that are kind of outward things that people are gonna see Hey, we're trying to get all this stuff right. We're trying to do as God would have us to do. But then it's like, you don't even have to ever bring up those things to anyone. And then you got people just, oh, so why is it that you got, why do you have to have your daughters wearing skirts all the time? Huh? <laughs> like, why do you got to do that? It's like, you, you know what I'm saying is true. You got the family member. Trying to get some of her birthday and going like, well, I just want your daughter to be wearing some jeans or whatever, right? And it's just kind of like, it's so stupid at the end of the day. Like, look, we have this belief. We're not telling you that you have to do this or anything. Like, like this. we're just trying to live our way righteously, the way that we see the word of God. And the more you change and the more you're trying to, to make these changes in your life and you can politely and tactfully say, oh, no, thanks. I don't want to go do that. No, I don't, you know. We don't really do that. We don't participate with that. We don't, you know, it's okay. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the offer. Thanks for, you know, whatever. And people just get angry. It's like, you don't, you don't even have to ever say anything about it. You try to be polite and they do it anyways. It happens. Now look, those aren't the workers of iniquity. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's similar in the fashion here. Daniel's just doing everything right. Yeah, and to the best of his ability. He's just, he's doing, trying to be upright, trying to be righteous, trying to be honest. They hate him for it. And they're conspiring. I mean, these wicked people are literally plotting and planning. There's a conspiracy theory against Daniel. Oh, you conspiracy theorists. There's a literal conspiracy. I mean, they're talking together. These are rulers, people in high positions, trying to get Daniel out. And you think those things don't happen today? You're insane. Like, even just turn on the slanted news that doesn't even tell you the truth anyways, and you can still see it through all of that garbage. You can still see it. It's so obvious. Anyway, I'm, not going, I'm not going down that path tonight. Verse 6, Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal state. Now, first of all, I don't know if that's true, but they want to make it sound like everybody's in agreement about this. They kind of left one person out, though, right? 
They've consulted together, established a royal statute, and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. And we know the story, right? Of course, Daniel, that isn't going to stop him from going straight to the Lord in prayer. Daniel doesn't hide. He doesn't make any changes to his routine. He does everything exactly the same. And nope. This is how I do it. I'm going to leave my window open. I'm going to pray to the Lord. And then, of course, they're, I mean, they're just setting the trap for him. Aha, ha, see, look, we got him. But then what happens? God defends them. And then they get thrown into that pit. They're the ones that get it brought back against them. And that's the way God works. And that's just a small illustration of this greater truth. Back in Psalm 94, let's close up with the last two verses, Right? Because verse 20 and 21, they're talking about the throne of iniquity, framing mischief by a law. They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. How wicked is that? How, how vile they are? How reprehensible? What horrible people? Verse 22, but, hey, the Lord is my defense and my God is the rock of my refuge. Amen. Hey, God is still my strength. He's my defender. Amen. They're wicked and they're going to come against me. But I don't care because God is my defense and he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. Amen. We need to put this to music and sing this psalm. because That's exactly what this is. It's a song about the righteous vengeance of the Lord against the wicked, evil doers and the, the spiritual wickedness in high places. Praise God that he is the judge. Praise God for his vengeance. Praise God for his righteousness. And praise God for the chastening of those of us that are children of God. To, that he loves us enough to keep us away from all this junk and all this garbage. To, to stop us from going down the path that the people who have no conscience are just <sighs> dropping to the bottomless pit. All right, I've spoken long enough. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for the free gift of salvation, Lord. That has nothing to do with our good works. We thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood for us, dear Lord. We, we thank you for saving our souls. And we thank you that you've made that gift available to everyone, anyone that would call upon the name of the Lord in faith, dear Lord, that you give them the gift of eternal life. Thank you so much for that, God. And we pray that you would help us to get that message out there before people harden their heart, before they go down the path before they just turn into these reprobates. Lord, help us to reach them before they would ever get to that point. And, and to, as much as possible, those that still might end up doing it are just, they've only done it full, well, 100% completely knowing and, and just wind up nothing to do with it, Lord. But help us to reach then the rest of the people that might be impacted by those that don't have a conscience, Lord, so that we can reach them and that they wouldn't end up um, having a skewed view of reality because of, because of some wickedness another person does. And Lord, help us to reach just as many people as possible. Lord, guide our steps. Help us to reach the people. Um, you know the, the end from the beginning. And um, God, help us to be strong in, uh, in our adversity, the day of adversity, Lord, and, and be with us and strengthen us. Uh, relying on you for your strength. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.